And the United States still largely exposed in a good number of countries. And that's what President Trump wants to do. He doesn't want to pull out of the Middle East. He wants to pull out of the hot spots of the Middle East. And just to remind people around the world about something very similar, not only did the United States do that in Somalia and Lebanon, that's what Israel has been cleverly doing in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Syria, pulling out troops from Lebanon and Gaza, and then using drones, guided missiles, air force, cyber, and so on and so forth, to hit its enemies. So not pulling out, really? Redeploying. Right. The, the idea is to redeploy. And the United States, when it, as your guest uh, said before, when it redeployed out of Syria, it didn't redeploy necessarily back to the United States. It redeployed to ships, to Navy, to, to various bases it has in the region. It has the Sixth Fleet and the Fifth Fleet still in the Gulf and in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And by the way, just so we're all clear on some strategic 101, the United States needs to stay in the Middle East because it doesn't want Russia and China to come Indeed. into the Middle East for the void. Two, just two simple figures. China imports more than half of its oil from the Middle East. Japan imports 90% of its oil from the Middle East. If you want to control the energy sources of Japan and China, what, do, what should you do? Well, you should control a lot of the ins and outs of the Middle East in order to put your competition in check. If you want to have an advantage over China, you're, you maintain control of the Middle East. Marwan, thank you very much. As always, very good to get your insight on this. U.S. is a terrorist state. America is a terrorist state. That is one of the many chants which could be heard outside the U.S. Embassy in London on Sunday, as Arab and Iranian protesters vented their anger following the U.S. assassination of senior Iranian commander Lieutenant General Qasem Soleimani and Iraqi anti-terrorism commander Abu Mehdi al mohandis This protest comes following U.S. President Donald Trump's latest threats to strike 52 important targets inside Iran itself, including cultural sites. This has only ignited deeper anger, with many seeing it as a pledge by Trump that the U.S. is prepared to commit war crimes. The latest threat by Trump appears to have failed to intimidate these protesters who have branded Trump a criminal. The mask that America's been wearing all this time has come off for everybody to see. It is a deceitful, lying, rogue country that needs to be brought into line with every other sort of civilized country in the world. It is showing itself as completely uncivilized and it's a shame. I heard today that Dominic Raab is another one of those levers of power uh, who's been uh, told, rather like the great Satan, America itself, the little Satan has now joined in and says that these bombings of 52 sites and heritage centers is okay. Uh, where on earth does this come from? Uh, you're going to attack civilizational, cultural, heritage centers as well. Uh, basically, nothing is sacred to these people. Uh, they are under orders. They've sold their souls to the devil. Uh, they are a part and parcel of that devil, and they can't go back. It's up to the people and the ordinary masses around the world to say, no, enough is enough, stop. We will not allow you to continue in our name to perpetrate uh, death, murder all over the world. Many of these protesters explain to me that the US has crossed a red line which they cannot return from. They explained that they want all US troops out of the region and that the era of US interventionism must come to an end. Over in Iraq, legislators used an extraordinary parliamentary session on Sunday to vote on the resolution requiring the government to press Washington and its allies to withdraw their troops from Iraq. So perhaps these protesters' demands will materialize. Robert Carter, Press TV, London. These forces that the U.S. is now targeting were leading forces in defeating ISIS. Of course, the U.S. is also using ISIS to an extent as a boogeyman, saying that ISIS is under your bed, that it's always... I mean, ISIS has been militarily defeated and doesn't control territory in the same way it did just two years ago. The thing, though, is that the U.S. is claiming credit for, for destroying ISIS, when in reality, Iran, Hezbollah, the Syrian government and the Syrian army and Russia were the leading forces that broke the back of ISIS. You're not allowed to mention that in mainstream corporate media. And what's not even less acknowledged, basically never acknowledged in mainstream corporate media, and this is a point we really need to stress, is that from day one, from the rise of ISIS, 
the U.S. and its allies saw ISIS as a convenient tool and didn't necessarily, they were, they were, let's put it this way, this is putting it mildly, they were in no rush to defeat ISIS. And there were different conflicts, Saudi Arabia and Qatar we now know supported ISIS as long, along with Turkey. And I'm gonna cut to an article here that I wrote back when I was actually at Salon, and this was in 2016. The, the article's titled, U.S. NATO-backed Israeli think tank, don't destroy ISIS, it's a useful tool against Iran, Hezbollah, and Russia. And in this article, I talk about how the director of a think tank that, again, is, is directly supported by the U.S. Embassy in Israel is also, it does contract work for NATO. So this is directly part of this imperialist war machine. The leading, the director of this think tank, who is a leading Israeli commentator who worked in the Israeli government, he said, very openly, quote, the continuing existence of the Islamic State serves a strategic purpose. He said ISIS, quote, can be a useful tool in undermining Iran, Hezbollah, Syria, and Russia. So, I mean, this, this is just says everything right there. And then I also, we have an article at the Gray Zone going back several years now that looks at some of the leaked emails from Hillary Clinton that were published by WikiLeaks. And of course, WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assange is in prison being tortured right now. And in these, this, this is an article I wrote back in 2016. This leaked Hillary Clinton email from 2014 cites U.S. Western intelligence services saying that they knew that Saudi Arabia and Qatar were supporting ISIS. Of course, NATO member Turkey was supporting ISIS as well. So this just gets back to the fact that the U.S. has tried to rewrite this history of the Syrian war, which, you know, if you follow our work at the Gray Zone, if you've read Max's book, The Management of Savagery, if you've listened to Rania's podcast, um, you might know, of course, that the, the, these Western governments and their proxies like Saudi Arabia, of Israel, of course, they all supported these Salafi jihadi so-called rebel groups inside Syria. And meanwhile, the boogeymen that we're supposed to believe are going to attack us, you know, Bill de Blasio, the, the fake progressive New York City mayor, went on Twitter and said that we've deployed the NYPD to strategic areas to save, to protect us from the Iranian threat. Iran has never intentionally targeted a U.S. civilian, especially on U.S. territory. That is so insane. And the LAPD did the same thing. There's this intentional fear campaign as if Iran is somehow like the actual Salafi jihadi terror groups that the U.S.'s allies were supporting and Iran was fighting. So we just have to really, we have to push back against this narrative that Iran is somehow like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Iran is one of the leading forces fighting Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And why? It's because the majority of Iranians are Shia. And if you know anything about Al-Qaeda and ISIS, anything about these Salafi jihadi groups that are influenced by the extremist Wahhabi form of, of Saudi regime-sponsored Islam, these are extremist Sunni Muslims. The majority of Muslim, Sunni Muslims in the world are not extremists, but they are extremist Sunnis who see other forms of Islam as apostasy. And especially the people they hate the most in the entire world are Shia. And Iranians are Shia. Many Syrians are Shia. So the only way that the corporate media and the U.S. government can try to conflate these countries together and act as though Al-Qaeda and Iran and all these Muslims are the same, they can only do it because of ignorance and Islamophobia. But the reality, again, to stress this point, is that Iran and the IRGC and leaders like Qasem Soleimani were the leading forces in defeating ISIS. And to quote the major Iranian scholar Mohammed Morandi, as he's been repeating again and again, were it not for generals like Soleimani and the Iranian military, the black flag of ISIS would be hanging above numerous Middle Eastern capitals right now, including potentially Baghdad and Iraq and potentially Damascus and Syria. And the U.S. is directly responsible for the rise of ISIS. Hassan Nasrallah uh, had reiterated that all American military assets across this region are now in danger, that they are now targets. Uh, this was a point that he made several times throughout his speech, but he did draw an important distinction. Mr. Nasrallah went on to say, I want to be very clear. We do not mean American citizens or nationals. There are many Americans in our region. We don't mean to attack them. 
and it is wrong to harm them. Attacking U.S. civilians anywhere serves Trump's interests. He also went on to say the Americans will withdraw from our region humiliated in disgrace. Uh, and he also, he also went on to say the minute Americans start seeing their sons in coffins, the Americans and President Trump will know they lost the war and the region. I think one of the more fascinating and telling things about um, the speech by Mr. Nasrallah, which lasted well over an hour, is the fact uh, that he continued to speak about Iraq. That really seemed to be one of the main themes uh, when it came to his remarks. And many of his remarks lined up uh, quite a bit with what Iraq's uh, uh, prime minister caretaker Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi was telling Parliament. Uh, his speech was happening at the same time as Mr. Nasrallah's. Um, you had uh, both, lead, uh, both of these men uh, urging uh, uh, the U.S. to withdraw from Iraq, um, and this really seemed to suggest a very coordinated effort uh, from Iran uh, for perhaps both of these men to be relaying this same type of message. Um, at the moment in Lebanon, you have another crisis going on. It's unclear how much exactly Hezbollah wants to ratchet up tensions because Hezbollah is, is, is involved in trying to form a government here. Uh, this is a country that's on the verge of bankruptcy. This is a country um, that has not had a government uh, for quite a while now. And uh, this is a very important time in Lebanon where the prime minister designate is trying to put together a cabinet and he cannot do so unless he has Hezbollah's uh, support as right. well because they are part of the major political block here. So um, this speech by Hassan Nasrallah, yes, Yes, it did threaten Americans, but it did not go into detail specifically about how exactly Lebanon would play a role right. in any retaliation. And because of that, it focused much more on Iraq's role in expelling Americans. I from was the going region. to ask you, Foley? in fact, uh, Mohammed, what, what was the likelihood of Hezbollah retaliating uh, for Iran? Well, that's the big question. We had expected to hear much more specificity uh, from Mr. Nasrallah about what exactly might be happening uh, in Lebanon. That's what a lot of analysts believe we might be hearing today. Many of the Lebanese uh, the last few days, they have been worried that because of what happened uh, to uh, Qasem Soleimani uh, and because of uh, Iran's strong ties and backing of Hezbollah, that perhaps uh, retaliation could be seen against Americans uh, in Lebanon, that perhaps violence could be uh, revisited upon Lebanon. And that's not something people want to see happen here. But also you have to realize that Hezbollah Hezbollah is a bit boxed in right now because of all the politics going on right now, because of the fragile economy, and Hezbollah uh, cannot really risk at this particular moment getting into a wider regional or international conflict. At least that's the conventional wisdom. So uh, many people here at this hour believe that is why Mr. Nasrallah perhaps did not focus so much on what Lebanon's specific role might be in retaliation, spoke more about the region, spoke more about Iraq and Iran. And and specifically spoke about the fact that it would not be U.S. civilians targeted, but it would be U.S. military assets targeted going forward. Thank Order. you for that. Mohammed Jamjoon, live for us in Beirut. Now, in an interview with a Hezbollah-affiliated television channel, Qasem Soleimani's daughter said she has no doubt there'll be retaliation for her father's death. Before anything, I'd like to send my greetings to the Supreme Leader Ayatoli Ali Khamenei and also to the leader of the resistance, Uncle Hassan Nasrallah, whom I know for sure will avenge my father's blood. The entire world must know that Haj Qasem's assassination will not break us and America must know that his blood is so precious. And we heard earlier from Abbas Mousavi, a spokesman for Iran's foreign ministry. He says Iran isn't pursuing war, but is prepared for anything. The Islamic Republic of Iran is not pursuing war, but we've made it very clear that we're ready for any kind of situation. In the past decades, the Iranian nation has always been ready to defend itself. The decision will always be made by the leadership and they will prepare their responses as to how to retaliate in the best way. In the meantime, that is trying to avoid war. 
Now, U.S. President Donald Trump has threatened to hit dozens of targets inside Iran if it takes any retaliatory action. In a series of tweets, Trump said that Iran would be hit, quote, very fast and very hard if attacks were launched against any Americans or U.S. assets. Iran's foreign minister has responded, saying targeting cultural sites would be a war crime. Patty Cohen is live for us in Washington, D.C. Patty, uh, let's start first with uh, this Iraqi vote in parliament calling for an end to U.S. troops, in, uh, to the presence of foreign troops, including U.S. troops. What's the reaction likely to be from Washington? Well, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has been making the rounds of the Sunday political talk shows, and he was pressed on that by several different of the anchors, the hosts, and he said, well, we hope that doesn't happen. We'll deal with it if it does, because uh, this was all happening as the vote was taking place. But he said that he believed the Iraqi people really wanted the Americans there. Uh, this is going to go down in two separate ways. The president's going to be talking to two very different audiences if, in fact, U.S. troops are told to leave Iraq immediately. First, it's going to be his core base. He will probably do what he tends to do in these situations, is not say that this is a strategic setback for the United States and its fight against ISIL, but he'll say, look, I promise to get U.S. troops out of the Middle East, and here they're coming home. The other audience that he really has to be concerned about at this point are members of the U.S. Senate. Let's put this in the broader context. This is a president facing impeachment. He's already been impeached by the House of Representatives. We are probably just weeks away, possibly, from an impeachment trial in the Senate, U.S. senators are going to realize the gravity of what this will do to the U.S. effort uh, to fight the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Uh, that is not going to go over well. But at the same time, there is growing concern uh, in the Senate, in the House, that the president is literally bringing the country to the brink of war with Iran. So that could also factor into uh, the whole impeachment discussion in a way that perhaps the president doesn't want it to. Hmm. Patty, President Trump on Saturday threatened to hit 52 Iranian sites very hard and very fast, he said, if Iran retaliated. And at the same time, the U.S. administration says it wants to negotiate and doesn't want regime change in Iran. You wonder... What is the strategy, the, the Trump administration's strategy here? Well, Secretary Pompeo on the shows that he was just talking on, he actually said that uh, if any American facilities or personnel are hit, that the U.S. will respond by targeting the Iranian personnel that planned the attack. So they're upping the threats, even though they're saying that they want to de-escalate the situation right now. The president in that tweet talking about 52 hits for the different, uh, all of the Americans that were held hostage sent, uh, decades and decades ago, uh, that's getting a reaction, especially from Democrats who agree with the Iranian foreign minister, and they're calling that a potential war crime. Mm. There has, of course, been discussion the U.S. military does have to follow the orders of the commander in chief, but in the military code, if they feel from any commander an order is unlawful, it is their duty, they are told, to not carry it out. So this could be just more bluster from President Donald Trump. Uh, but there is growing concern, especially among Democrats, that the intelligence that the White House is giving them just doesn't add up to basically what happened here, an assassination of a foreign leader that the country is not technically at war with. We are going to see movement this week, the House, the Senate. We expect that they're going to get full classified intelligence briefings. If even some Republicans start to come out and say there's not enough there there to take this dramatic of a step, you could see movement on legislation because although U.S. presidents of recent times, they just take military action and they don't really consult with Congress, technically in the Constitution, Congress has to declare war. Mm. We've seen a Democratic senator say he was going to try and put a resolution on the floor that says specifically the U.S. cannot go to war with Iran. Now, whether the Republican leadership will actually let that onto the floor remains to be seen. But this is going to be a critical week because in this system, it's supposed to be equal branches of government. So we'll see if Congress wants to assert themselves and be a check on this president where they really haven't for the last couple of decades when it comes to presidents and armed conflict. Patty, we've heard the political reactions from the Democrats to Republicans, but what about the wider American public? How much worry, how much concern is there that there could be a, a conflict with Iran? Well, and this is the, pr the problem for this president. He was elected in large part because he'd said he's going to stop these wars. He's going to spend that money here at home. His base does not want him to see a conflict, uh, another conflict in the Middle East. 
Uh, that said, these, are, these things can quickly escalate when you start doing tit-for-tat strikes. Uh, I can't say that there's been a whole lot of polling. A lot of that has to do with the calendar. It is the weekend here. All of this was happening over the Christmas holiday. And this tends to be a time, if there's a two-week period in time when Americans tend to turn off the TV and stop reading the newspaper, it's right now. So when Congress comes back from their Christmas break, uh, expect that they're, we're going to have a lot more talk about it. There's going to be a lot more people tuning in. Then they're going to start to see the American public opinion polls. In general, though, not about this specific issue, the vast majority of the American public in previous polls before this has, have said they have no desire to see another conflict in the Middle East. Thank you for that, Patty Cohen, live for us in Washington, D.C.